Hey, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Leadership Now with me, Dan Pontifrac. Today, Ravan Jesuthasan, who's a recognized futurist, global thought leader, and best-selling author on the future of work and human capital. He's led multiple research efforts on the global workforce, the emerging digital economy, the rise of artificial intelligence, and the transformation of work. Ravan is the global leader of transformation at Mercer and based in Chicago. He's led numerous research projects for the World Economic Forum, including its groundbreaking studies, shaping the future implications of digital media for society, creating a shared talent or shared vision, sorry, for talent in the fourth industrial revolution, and HR 4.0, shaping people's strategies in the fourth industrial revolution. Of course, he's a regular participant and presenter at the World Economic Forum's annual meetings in Davos. Ravan's a best-selling author of some really fantastic books. I encourage you to get these, including Work Without Jobs, Transformative HR, Lead the Work, and Reinventing Jobs. And, uh, you know, I guess like me, uh, Ravan and I are both members of the Thinkers 50 Radar class. So, Ravan, great to have you here today. Thanks so much. Um, your writing often points to the future uh, and the future of work in particular. And so let's start here while I've got you. Um, you, you believe that the future work kind of requires this ability to ensure that, you know, the organization, uh, the work that we do, the workforce itself have to be in sort of this uh, perpetual or systemic constant reinvention so that we continue to be relevant. And so you write about things like agility, uh, reskilling, resilience, et cetera. So why, first, first question, why is all of this so important as we're kind of figuring ourselves out going into hopefully a post-pandemic era? Yeah, F firstly, Dan, thanks for having me on. Um, uh, just lovely to catch up with you and, and have this conversation. So, you know, Dan, when, when uh, John Boudreau and I wrote our last book, um, and we, the reason we wrote it and, and the, the full title for the book, which just came out a couple of months ago, is Work Without Jobs, uh, a work operating system for the new world of work. Mm -hmm. um, because what we were seeing was that that legacy operating model indexed to this 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 one to one relationship between a degree, a job and a job holder, which has been the fundamental means for getting work done for the better part of the last 140 years, was no longer kind of fit for purpose, right? Um, and and, we're, and this, this pandemic, and we actually started writing the book in March of 2020. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so we had plenty of um, examples and evidence and conversations with business leaders who were just navigating this pandemic. And, and this pandemic in so many different ways, both the obvious and the maybe not so obvious, has accelerated the future of work exponentially. Um, you know, uh, Satya Nadella said in June of 2020, we've seen like this two year trend in digitalization get realized in two months. I actually think the impact on the future of work is more like a 20 year trend pull forward in the last two years, wow. because what we've seen is the combination of the, those same two forces that have driven the future of work for the last number of decades just accelerate. Certainly digitalization is one. And you're probably well aware of the growing uh, investment that companies are making in digitalization and how that's accelerated exponentially. Um, but the other much bigger, more insidious force, Dan, is you know, what we call the democratization of work. Mm -hmm. So our ability to decouple work from its traditional confines of space, time, and structure. And that's what you know, the combination of those two forces, not just individually, but the multiplier effect. And, and just to pick on one very topical, albeit a small part of this, is just this narrative and discourse around hybrid remote versus on-site work, right? Oh, yes. Let's and get into this because I'm fascinated what your take is on this because there's, um, of course, Robin, there's there's so many different examples out there of, of organizations and leaders choosing to do one way or forcing employers to do another, et cetera. So what's your take? Yeah. So, so that to me is like the tip of the iceberg, but it's just such a small part of the broader trend that's happened. My personal belief, Dan, is, and I, and I said this um, on CNBC not long ago, you know, the, the genie is out of the bottle, right? Yeah. Um, you know, despite the best efforts of various CEOs, we won't talk about them yeah. um, to sort of say, you know, back to the office, back to work. And if you don't come back to the office, we're going to have a different conversation or, you know, you can go look for another job, you know, good luck to you, because mm. um, the 
the expectation now is, and, and it's a little hypocritical, right? Because for two years, we said to the workforce, wow, we've been super productive. We've produced exponential profits. It's, it's allowed us to maintain employment. It's resulted in this massive growth in profits and the stock price. And all of a sudden now it's like, oh, well, we need you back in the office. And, and I also think then, you know, I'm, I'm not saying for a second that there is no place or no reason for in-person work. I believe it is fundamental. Um, but I think many leaders have just not made the case for why you need to come back. And so in the consulting that I do um, at Mercer, a lot of the work that we've been doing with some world-class organizations has been about building the case for what work needs to be done in person. Where is there a premium to human collaboration, human co-creation and empathy and care and concern, et cetera, versus where, frankly, you know, where are the activities that we can actually do offsite or remotely or asynchronously? And mm -hmm. that really is um, one of the reasons why John and I wrote the book, you know, chapter one of the book, chapter two, rather, is this big idea of deconstruction applied to the great work that Genentech was doing to actually answer this question, not in 2022, but to answer the question in April of 2020, because you had a leadership team and an HR team that saw that this pandemic was going to fundamentally reset work and the experience of work and wanted to get ahead of it to say, you know, let's rethink our model. Yes, we've invested in this magnificent campus, but what we want is not to be driven by these legacy investments, but by a work experience that is going to help us execute our mission. Well, what's fascinating, however, Ravin, is that there's, there's some irony here, of course, right? Like the fact that uh, we had to, you know, shove the knowledge worker home um, during the pandemic. And it seemed to be, as you point out quite rightly, that revenues, EBITDA, share prices, everything seemed to be tickety-boo for the period of, you know, March 2020 through to even present day. Yet, what is it that is um, sort of forcing these leaders to say, no, I need you in the office all the time? Like, there's, there's some sort of, I can't put my finger on it. That's why I'm asking you. It's like, yeah. it doesn't quite make sense to me. Inertia and legacy are really powerful forces, Dan. Um, and, and, and I really think it's, I, th I think there's two things, right? It's, you know, again, it's 150, 140 years of learned behavior. It's really tough to undo it. And, you know, it was kind of forced to be undone because we had to keep the lights on for the last two years. Mm -hmm. But now that you have an option, we're kind of defaulting to that legacy. I think that's one part of it. I think the other part is, is also, you know, the fact that all of us kind of grew up in that environment, right, as leaders. You know, it's, it's what made us successful. And, and again, maybe it's also, again, a part of that inertia and legacy, this belief that particularly for this next generation, and I do think there is some merit to this because I've got a son who's 22 and started his first job and he's completely remote, so he's in his bedroom, yeah. <laughs> literally. Uh, 24 hours a day. Um, and it's a completely different work experience. Um, he's blessed to have worked for an organization and a manager who are deeply in sync with what it requires for, you know, an entry level remote worker. And so they've actually cultivated leadership muscle and processes and disciplines that are very different from what, you know, you or I might have experienced in our first jobs. And I, and I think that's where many of these leaders perhaps you know, need some help, right? I, I think they need some help to see what is the new muscle that needs to be built, you know, so we don't have to force the, you know, all of our workforce back to the, you know, back to 2019, mm -hmm. but actually have something that is going to be fit for purpose for, you know, 2022 or, you know, better yet, 2030. Well, let's, let's dig into that. So you write about this new work operating system. And uh, so what are kind of the key or critical elements that you see as we've uh, looked back at Taylorism through to, um, you know, Uncle Walt, uh, Milt Friedman, sorry, and sort of shareholder return right through to the pandemic. And now here we are at the stage, really, I think you're right, of HR 4.0. Like, what does, what do we need in this new organization to set up as the new pillars of uh, the operating system? Yeah, so, so I think there are two key fundamental things and, and that, that I think are going to shape the new world of work. And then I want to maybe just touch on the four, um, 
four principles that shape this new work operating system. So to me, the two most pivotal things, Dan, that are going to reset work, uh, the two most pivotal questions for all business leaders is one is, how do we redesign work to enable talent to flow to it as seamlessly as possible while sending it the signals and the assets and the resources to enable that talent to perpetually reinvent itself? Because we know that we're going to keep digitalizing and automating. We know that some tasks are going to go away. New work is going to emerge. So how do we ensure that that talent can keep reinventing itself? So I think that's the first question. The second is, as we've sort of alluded to with this whole where is work done and when it's done, is how do we re-envision that talent experience? And, you know, I use the word talent experience as opposed to employee experience quite deliberately because... Okay. I think we need to think about, you know, work being done by anyone in various types of work engagement models. It could be an employee, it could be a gig worker, the employee of your outsourcer, maybe an employee who's not tied to a job, but in kind of an agile talent pool. But that second question is, how do we re-envision that talent experience so that we are meeting more and more people on their individual terms, as opposed to forcing them to fit our one size fits most, which is a massive ask of the, the HR function, right? Because right. again, for 130 years, we designed one model and people either fit that model and were successful or they didn't and, and they left or were not hired in the first place. And I, I don't think we have that luxury anymore. Um, and so against that, those questions, what, what John and I did was to sort of talk about, you know, what does that new work operating system look like? And how do we ensure that in this era of rapid disruptive change, um, significant rebalancing in terms of the power of different stakeholders to your point about the shift from shareholder value to stakeholder value um, and you know, an operating system that reflects the fluidity of modern work and work arrangements. Um, what we articulated were four principles. One is, instead of starting with how the work is organized or where the work is done to that discussion we just had about legacy ways of working, right. let's start with the work itself, the fundamental tasks and activities, both the ones that exist today and the ones to come, not how they're organized or where they're situated. Secondly, let's ask the question of what is the optimal combinations of humans and automation? And we wrote extensively about this in Reinventing Jobs where we showed that with 130 case studies, organizations who led with the work, as opposed to those who led with technology, organizations who led with the work saw three nuanced outcomes in this narrative about what the optimal combinations are. They saw where highly repetitive rules-based work could be substituted. They saw where um, human ingenuity, ingenuity, critical thinking, creativity, innovation, empathy, care and concern could be augmented by capabilities like machine learning, deep learning, social and collaborative robotics. And they also saw where the presence of automation either transformed work or created the space uh, and demand for new human skills. Hmm. And then once you've gotten to that optimal combination, the third principle, you know, going back to the two questions I started off with is, what's the full array of different ways in which people could engage with the work? You know, should it be an employee in a job? Should it be, you know, an internal talent marketplace that connects skills to work? Should it be the employee of an, uh, of an alliance partner or, a, or, an outsour or, or your outsourcer? Should it be a gig worker off of a marketplace like Upwork? Um, and then once you've gotten to that optimal combination, how do we consistently, to your opening question, right? How do we consistently take out the frictional cost of work by enabling talent to flow to it, perpetually reinventing that work operating system, as well as the talent itself, as work and demand, you know, demand for work changes. What I love about your insights and your research and your writing and your speaking, all of it, Robin, is you, you've you've kind of articulated a, a new new concept for HR to think about. I would say, and that is, uh, let's let you know, down with the JD or what's known as the job description, and let's let's elevate. Uh, skills and tasks. And so do you see a place for HR to effectively create almost like a, a free agency pool where tasks or projects could be by the business units like thrown into a pot and there's a, a, an ecosystem of talent and skill um, of the employees to say, oh, you know what? 
I want to try that for six months. I want to go in and be an internal gig worker, if you will, because I'm employed by the company already full time. But I would like to go try that for six months or that for nine months, almost like a, an apprenticeship secondment model all mashed together under a free agency banner. Do you see that being part of our new future of work? Absolutely, Dan. Um, and, you know, so I really think strategically we are at the, the precipice of where HR is shifting its role from being a steward of employment to being a steward of work. Mm. Uh, acting as that trusted advisor with the business leader of actually navigating and kind of using these four principles that I talked about as kind of their, their sort of touchstone to help business leaders navigate not just the emerging choices, but navigate how we keep that workforce, you know, perpetually relevant. Um, you know, and it's one of the reasons why, Dan, this notion of the internal marketplace is like the hottest topic in, in, in HR. Um, more and more organizations are implementing these marketplaces. Um, there's more venture capital and PE money flowing into these marketplaces than any other part of HR, specifically and precisely for the reasons you just articulated, which are, you know, how do we make it much easier to connect talent to work? How do we leverage the skills of people? How do we do actually, frankly, multiple things, right? How do we understand the skills of the talent we have today? Most organizations have an incredibly poor understanding of the skills they have. Yeah. They know that you can do X because you sit and function Y and, and you, you, know, you, you can do that, but they, they know nothing else about the certifications you have, the experiences you've had before, the skills you've acquired along the way. And, and that's where these marketplaces really become incredibly powerful because not only do they uncover the, the skills you really have, they're able to match those skills to emerging bodies of work and able to stretch the capacity of the workforce. And it takes you out of this, this very siloed, highly expensive model of every time a new body of work shows itself, managers do one of two things. They either open a rec or they delegate the work to someone on their team. And that's an incredibly inefficient way of getting work done. It's very expensive. We've also seen more and more talent acquisition functions change their mandate from being focused on external talent to frankly being more of a resourcing function. You know, it doesn't matter where the talent comes from, external, internal, gig, et cetera. We're going to help you, Mr. Ms. Manager, to navigate those choices and determine the best one for the body of work that's that's required. So then I guess sticking with HR for a second here, Robin, what does HR have to do? Does it have to turn itself into the talent marketplace as opposed to the, you know, the talent arbiter? Yeah, I, I think HR need uh, is, and we, we see evidence of this, right? And I'll, I'll point to one organization that I think is just, just done a masterful sure. job. Um, it's Unilever. Yeah. I've had the privilege of working with them since 2017 help them develop their framework for the future of work. And they're actually a case study in the book. Um, but they have been, and, and the foundations for that work were laid well before that. <clears throat> but you had a CHRO in Lena Nair, um, who has since gone on to be the CEO of Chanel, um, and a CEO in the form of Alan Joke that really sort of understood the need for agility and perpetual reinvention of the workforce as their business model was changing, as they were sort of looking to make various, you know, stand up new products, sunset others, et cetera. <clears throat> and that framework has become the basis for their use of their internal marketplace, their Uflex model that enables talent in at various stages of their life cycle and, um, and, 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 you know, the seasons of their life to engage with the work of Unilever on their terms. Um, and so, you know, there is, I think HR has a number of things it needs to do. I think it really needs to lead with a framework around the future of work. I think it needs to also have the capabilities to, re, to work with business leaders to understand the work options, to reinvent them, to rethink how talent connects to work, and then ensure that these changes are being deployed in a responsible, sustainable way. Um, and that calls for you know, rethinking the talent architecture and the human capital architecture, because you're, I'm not just hiring employees, what's the value proposition for gig workers? You know, most companies don't even think I need a value proposition for gig workers, but the really progressive ones actually do have them. You know, what's my value proposition for, you know, the retirees who I'm trying now to engage on projects and assignments. 
So, so thinking through the architecture, but not just HR architecture, because this new work operating system, you know, puts a fundamentally different set of calls on, you know, how we think about finance and accounting. Because instead of me thinking of employees and jobs and my budget, now, Dan, I'm saying to you, you, you can't just think about keeping your people busy. You've got to go tap into the best talent that may be elsewhere. Yeah. And you've got to share your talent with someone else. That's deeply challenging for many managers. <laughs> Well, and that speaks to then the culture that we require, right? So, you know, uh, I often lament and or laugh at organizations that still call their business units divisions. And I challenge them and say, well, if you call them divisions, guess what they're going to do? They're going to divide one another, right? So why are you calling them divisions? So my point being when I'm cheekily bringing that up is, are we not all playing for the crest on the front of our jersey, not, you know, the name on the back? And if the crest on the front of the jersey is the logo of the company, then we need to be looking altruistically at the health of all units, all divisions, all you know employees, and not hoarding the talent. Because you know if if Jill or Sandeep in my unit uh, has been with me for two or three years, and I'm looking at at her and saying, oh, you know what? Maybe there's an opportunity for you over in marketing, and I'm in finance or I'm in IT. That's the type of culture we need that uh, allows that benevolence uh, inwardly, if you will, to be displayed expert, expert, ex- outwardly, sorry, so that other units can benefit from Sandeep or, um, or Jill in this case. So how do we get to the culture, I guess, in that particular situation there, Robin? Yeah, Dan, it's so well said. You know, if you, if you think to your, and I love that phrasing of just the division, that, that no mindset of a, of a division versus a business unit and, you know, talent as an enterprise asset. Because if you think of financial capital, right, in large organizations, that financial capital is unfettered, right? It flows mm. to the best opportunity. Um, and recognizing that, you know, frankly, capital is not scarce. It just has a price, right? And so can we afford the price of that capital? And, and I think the same thing with our human capital. And I to the earlier point I made, but I've seen our organizations who are starting to make some new rules. So let me give you a couple of really tactical examples. So mm. with I've got a couple of clients as they institute the marketplaces and they're trying to break their managers of, you know, their legacy, right? And their mindset and, and the inertia that they've had. They've put in place new rules around how their performance is going to be managed. So managers now are told, you don't get to open a new rec unless you've actually attempted to source that talent on the marketplace. And, and so again, you know, HR going to play that, you know, the policing function in, in that respect, mm-hmm. you know, don't, have you put it out there? Have you been sincere about it? Have you actually looked, if you have, you know, that's, that's fine. Then we'll go open the rec. So a very tactical thing. The other has been, you know, and, you know, <laughs> someone made a comment to me once, Nobody asks for permission to go work for a c- competitor. Why do they have to ask for permission to go work for another function, you know, or division? <laughs> oh, true. Um, and, and so, you know, but, but yet as a way of stepping managers in, we've seen one HR function say, look, you know, you have to give and get. You're going to take, you know, you're going to put 10% of your work out there and you're going to give 10% of your team's capacity out there. If you lose Sally to another function because she's more interested in the work over there, we will put you to the top of the list in terms of opening a new rec to replace that talent. And we'll ensure you get someone exceptional. But it's a way of, as a, as, as a way of managing the change, making it easier for managers to want to sort of engage in the game. It's, it's not the ideal end solution, right? But it's, it's sort of, in, you know, stepping them through this process to break from their legacy. All right, one penultimate question, and then I'll ask you where we can find out more about you and work with our jobs. Um, what I think we've found and discovered a little bit out of this pandemic between um, you know, the lines, if you will, is that there's an intersection that was, I guess, invisible, but now it's certainly more pro- pro- like profound, and that is the intersection between work and life. And so the employer, I argue, needs to be looking at the employee and what they bring to work but also taking a look at their life and saying, well, what are those things that I should be doing to help that individual become, you know, that best version of themselves? So I'm curious, and as you've been thinking through HR and the future of work and, you know, work without jobs, is is this relationship between work and life something that that the employer also has to help 
the employee with? And if so, then what, what might we be doing in that case? Yeah, Dan, I'm, I'm so glad you asked that question because I, I really do think, you know, it goes back to what I said with those two fundamental questions. I think designing work so that as many people as possible can engage with it on their terms, mm. I think is really essential. You know, we at Mercer, our whole mantra is leading with economics and empathy. Um, and, I, and I think, you know, that empathy piece has been absent for so long. It's one of the reasons, Dan, um, and if your listeners are interested, go to the World Economic Forum website. Um, I was privileged to be one of the co-authors for uh, 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 what's called the Good Work Framework. And there are some 27 companies that are now signatories to it. They employ over um, two or three million people around the world. And the plan is to get to many, many more than that. But it's a set of minimum standards for what it means to actually have good work in organizations. Um, You know, minimum standards around a living wage, a set of minimum standards around space and time for reskilling and upskilling, not having that be an option because we know work's going to change, jobs are going to change, and we have to keep our talent relevant. I often say to our clients, you know, it's really important that we design space, space for learning space for well-being into the flow of work. And I think it comes with that, those two pillars of, you know, balancing economics and empathy. Gosh, I love, I love of you to highlight that. Robin, Jason Thousand, thank you so much. Uh, where can we find out more about you and Work Without Jobs? So uh, we have a website for the book, workwithoutjobs.com. You can also visit robinjaysuthasan.com. And I'd also encourage you to visit um, mercer.com and see some of the uh, solutions we have out there for our transformation business. Fantastic. Uh, Thank you so much, my friend. Uh, Look forward to the next one. Thank you, Dan. Such a pleasure to be here with you.